Many people believe that electric cars are a simple drop-in replacement for our regular petrol and diesel cars. That we can simply transition from a world of fuel stations and engines to a world of charging stations and batteries. And by doing so, magically reduce our carbon dioxide emissions and save the planet. As nice as that sounds, it is a dangerously naive view that has unfortunately been swallowed whole by most Western governments, ours included. In this video, we're going to look at five fundamental misconceptions about EVs and explain why they are not the panacea that so many believe they are, and in fact will do more harm than good. Welcome back to MGuy, British engineer and lawyer, now Sydney YouTuber. I'm closing in on 100k subscribers, which is absolutely insane. So if you're one of the majority of my viewers who are not subscribed to this channel, please just click that subscribe button so you don't miss any future videos. And if you'd like to contribute to this channel, why not buy me a coffee? Click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. Number one, EVs aren't electric cars, they're battery cars. Yes, and petrol cars are actually air cars. This might seem trivial, but stick with me because it's fundamental, as you'll see. When you fill up your regular car, the petrol or diesel that you put in the tank is the source of energy for the car. Burning the fuel in the cylinders of the engine is converting that energy directly into the motion of the pistons that drive the wheels. And the benefit of this is that the largest component of this process is completely free, oxygen from the air. An average petrol car has an air to fuel ratio of about 13 to 1, meaning the engine is gulping in huge quantities of air as it moves, and that air does not have to be carried around in the car as extra weight. Petrol and diesel engines should really be called air engines, as that's what they use the most. But unlike petrol or diesel, electricity is not a source of energy itself. It's a means of transmitting energy from one place to another. The energy is generated someplace else, usually at a power station, by extracting energy from some fuel, be that fossil or nuclear, or extracting it from some other source, like the gravitational flow of water in hydro, the movement of the wind, or the solar radiation from the sun. The conversion to electricity is a convenient way to move it about. To store it in an EV requires the enormous battery, weighing hundreds of kilograms, essentially a complex chemical reaction that releases electrical energy to power the motors of the car. Sooner or later, there will be a source of energy that we will be able to use to actually generate electricity in a vehicle, at which point EVs might make some sense. And that doesn't include hydrogen fuel cells either, because the hydrogen itself must be created by using energy elsewhere. It's just like electricity, but even harder to transport. So as we will see, because electricity is just a means of transporting energy, battery cars require the chemical reaction in the battery to be reset and forced to go the other way by charging, which is the Achilles heel of the battery car fantasy. Number two. The charging conundrum. The charging conundrum is the name I have given to the relationship between charging power and charging time. They are linked by an inverse relationship. As you seek to decrease the charging time, you must increase the charging power. Before we start, a quick reminder that the units used to describe EV battery capacity, the kilowatt hour, is a unit of energy, whereas a kilowatt is a unit of power, the amount of energy per second. Let's take a simple example of an EV with a fairly standard 60 kilowatt hour battery. If you want to charge that in one hour, you will need a 60 kilowatt power supply. Just to put that into perspective, your kettle, one of the most power hungry appliances in the house, uses about two and a half kilowatts and is on for about five minutes. 60 kilowatts, and that's to charge the car in one hour, a hopelessly inconvenient time. So, what do you do if you want to charge it in 30 minutes? You'll need a 120 kilowatt power supply. For 15 minutes, you'll need 240 kilowatts. As the charging time gets shorter, the power rises faster and faster. So, when you hear that they've just invented some magical new battery that can charge in 5 minutes, the question you should ask is, where does the 720 kilowatts of electrical power come from to do that? And that's for one car. Number three, public charging will never be cheap and fast. No, it won't. It will always be slow or expensive. 
Linked to the charging conundrum is the cost of the electrical grid infrastructure required to deliver those ridiculous levels of power. An ordinary fuel station may have 10 pumps and, with a car taking, say, 10 minutes per fill, can get through 60 cars an hour. What kind of charging station would you need to do the same with EVs? Let's say you need to get 60 EVs through in an hour and let's be generous and say that each requires just a 30 kilowatt hour charge. That's half full. The total power supply required to do this would be nearly 2 megawatts. 2 million watts. Enough power for a small industrial estate or nearly 300 average homes. You'd also need 30 charging stalls to allow them each to sit for half an hour to charge. Each charging stall can cost between fifty dollars and $100,000, so the cost of the chargers could be up to $3 million to start with. And we haven't even considered the connection to the grid yet, or the cost of the electricity itself. And that's assuming they only charge 50%. If you want to fill them up, multiply everything by two. So just cut the power in half, right? Fine, as long as you're prepared to wait twice as long to charge. When you start to appreciate the scale of the problem, you understand why the EV charging business is precarious. It has enormous capital costs and wafer-thin margins thanks to the cost of electricity at power levels in the megawatts. Compare this with the simplicity of a fuel station, basically just a huge tank in the ground, with pumps and pipes to get it to your car. And think about rural fuel stations. A delivery of fuel from a tanker every week is all it needs to keep it in business. But if it were an EV charging station, it would need either a connection to the grid sufficient to power the chargers or expensive battery energy storage systems to store electricity to cope with peak times. Number four. Battery cars aren't simpler than petrol or diesel cars. Nope, they're not. They're just differently complex, as I said in my video, 11 reasons why the EV transition will never happen, linked in the description and up here. While a petrol car has a complex engine and a simple energy source, the fuel tank, an EV has a simple engine, the electric motor, but a wildly complex energy storage system, the battery. As I discussed earlier, the battery is just a huge chemical reaction, contained within hundreds or thousands of separate cells. However, it is everything else that is required to manage this number of cells which is so complex, including thousands of individual connections, an entire cooling and heating system to ensure that the chemical reaction is kept at the correct temperature, together with electronic control units, sensors and much, much more. The irony is that the complexity of an engine is actually an advantage. Individual components can be easily replaced if and when they fail, meaning that maintenance of the engine is simple and economical. The battery, on the other hand, is a completely different matter. Apart from the fact that it is sealed inside a waterproof and impact-proof metal case, replacing a failed part in a battery is often much harder and more expensive than just replacing the entire thing. Insurance companies are wary of putting a repaired battery pack back on the road, as the consequences of, say, a fire happening could be significant. So they're more likely to declare a car with a damaged battery a total loss than take the risk. Hardly environmentally friendly, is it? Which brings me on to my final point. Number five. EVs aren't better for the environment. Unless you're fortunate enough to be able to charge your battery EV from solar panels on your roof, lucky you if you can, then you have no idea whether your car is zero emissions or not. If the electricity you use is not 100% renewable and or nuclear, then your car will be producing emissions. Just not from the tailpipe, but at a power station somewhere on the grid. The only state where that's happening right now, as I'm making this video, is Tasmania. All the other states are using black or brown coal or gas to supplement the renewables. And there's a hell of a lot of sunshine around right now. Every other electric car being driven in Australia is using fossil fuel generated electricity. And, of course, that doesn't begin to consider the vast carbon footprint of battery manufacture, which is the EV industry's dirty little secret. Whilst we smugly import those shiny EVs from overseas, preening ourselves for doing our bit to save the planet, all the emissions from the mining of the raw materials and the manufacture of the batteries are being churned out in China. 
They don't seem to worry as much as we do about the environment. They're just happy to be cashing in on our almost unbelievable stupidity. And don't fool yourself into thinking they're going to stop any time soon. China will soon be the dominant auto manufacturer if we continue down this insane net zero path. And they will maintain that position by using, guess what? Coal and oil. So there you are. Five common misconceptions about battery electric vehicles. Check out my other videos, 10 reasons why you should never buy an electric car and 11 reasons why the EV transition will never happen at the links in the description. I'm sure there are plenty of other frequent misunderstandings about EVs. Let me know in the comments if you have suggestions. But I think the biggest misconception is that a transition to a net zero economy and electric vehicles can possibly happen in the time frames they are suggesting. Our governments are literally living in cloud cuckoo land.